Park number seven, Death Valley National Park. It is the hottest place on the planet, the lowest place in North America, and one of the driest. So you're gonna wanna make sure you bring a lot of water. Definitely. We're gonna be showing you where to go from north to south throughout the park, where to stay, and yes, you can even eat here too. We're Howard and Caitlin Newstate. This year, we're traveling to 51 parks in 52 weeks. We're visiting all the U.S. national parks in the lower 48 in a special Winnebago Vista NPF limited edition. Each week, we're sharing where to stay, what to do, and introducing you to the people doing incredible work across our national parks. Death Valley, arguably the most ominous sounding of the national parks. And adding to the intrigue of the name is the park size. At 3.4 million acres, it's the largest U.S. national park outside of Alaska, and 93% of it is designated as protected wilderness. With close to 1,000 miles of paved or dirt roads and trails, there's a lot to see and do here. So we would recommend planning to stay several days here in Death Valley. As you might expect with a national park of this size, there are several entrances, and there are even many options for accommodations, a few gas stations, and restaurants all within the park boundaries. This is also one of those parks where you'll want to plan your visit around the weather. Death Valley is the hottest place on the planet with a world record high temperature of 134 degrees. Summer temps here can hit around 120 degrees in the shade, and the average rainfall is less than two inches. So remember, it's hot and dry, but winter and spring can be a great time to visit. We'll get to just how this park got its somewhat morbid name and what led to the tourism here in such a remote place, but first, let's go over the lay of the land. We enter Death Valley National Park from the southeast entrance. This is the closest entrance to Furnace Creek, which is where you'll find the main visitor center, camping, and the oasis at Death Valley, which is home to lodging, shopping, and dining. I think we would consider this the central hub of the park, and it's situated within proximity to several of the must-see and do activities. We stayed at the Furnace Creek Campground and were able to score a full hookup site, which can be rare in a national park campground. They have a mix of dry camping and full hookup sites available for reservation through recreation.gov. Once we were all set up, it was time to head out and explore this absolutely incredible landscape, starting high above the valley. If you're not already using the new National Park Service app, this is a shameless plug for something we're not getting paid for. It is great. <laughs> you can download all of the park maps, the calendars, every trail, everything for a national park, and have it in offline, which is a godsend when you are in a national park that usually has limited service. So right now we're heading to Dante's View, and I'm able to even navigate from this without any service at all. We took a little detour down 20 Mule Team Road, and it's a very windy but very smooth dirt road. And there was one point where we came around a turn and it literally stopped us in our tracks. It was so beautiful because you're up on this like plateau and you're overlooking all of these incredible dune formations. And then you've got like the dark mountains in the background. It was epic. So we're heading to another ominous sounding place. We are heading to Dante's View. And I'd like to point out that, first of all, there is a length restriction on this road. The last quarter mile, there was a sign that said is a 15% grade. Folks, that is really, really steep. So you wanna make sure that you have a vehicle that is small enough and also is capable of climbing a really steep hill. So one thing we are learning very quickly about Death Valley is that there are a lot of variant temperatures. So my hot tip for you is to make sure you throw an extra layer in the car so that you always have that because up here at Dante's View, it is quite chilly. For every 1,000 feet, it drops five degrees and you definitely feel it. <laughs> wow. That's amazing. Oh my gosh. This is beautiful. Definitely worth the drive. Wow. Dante's view is one of the most picturesque places in the park, towering over 5,000 feet above Badwater Basin, which is the lowest point in North America. You get incredible views of both the salt flats and the towering mountains. And if you're into stargazing, this is a great spot to visit at night, especially since Death Valley is designated as an international dark sky park. After snapping a few photos, we headed back down the road just in time for a great ranger-led walk at Golden Canyon. Hello everyone, my name is Ranger Annie. I'm a park ranger here at Death Valley National Park. 
Uh, we're gonna be doing the Golden Canyon walk today. We're gonna be going about three quarters of a mile into this canyon. Just about everyone here in Death Valley had to decide to come to a place called Death Valley, right? Except for one group of people, and that's the Timbisha Shoshone. The Timbisha Shoshone are the native people of this land, so this is their homeland. The next people that decided to come here were the miners, people that were out here looking for things like gold and silver and borax. So not a ton of gold or silver was found here. But the thing that made miners the most money was borax. Does anyone know what borax is? what it's used for cleaning. cleaning yeah so it's most famously a laundry additive so you add it to your laundry and it in theory makes your laundry cleaner you may have seen some borax sold in packaging that looks like this it's still sold today it's called 20 mule team borax and that was originally found and harvested right here in death valley harvesting a product here and then having to get it to market there's not a lot of people doing their laundry here in Death Valley back in the 1800s. So most of the people that were buying this product was somewhere else. So they had to get their product elsewhere. And to do that, they had to use 20 mule teams, which is a little bit of a misnomer. They were actually 18 mules and two horses. <laughs> but that doesn't quite roll off the tongue quite as well. And that's what they ended up branding their product after. But before the borax miners, there were gold miners. More they were coming out to the rest of California. They wanted to cross through Death Valley to get to the gold. And that's actually how we got our names. There was a group that was headed out to Western California and they hit the Sierra Nevadas about now. Does anyone know what's going on in the Sierra Nevadas this year in 2023? Lots of snow, yeah, not a great time to cross the Sierra Nevadas. So they decided to head south into a valley that they hadn't heard very much about before. And they were gonna spend four days crossing this valley. Well, they ended up spending four months <laughs> here instead. They got lost. They lost uh, one of their members. One person did die here in this valley. And so when they finally got to the other side of this valley, they stood up on the Panamint Mountains, they looked back and they said, goodbye, Death Valley. And that's how we ended up with the name Death Valley today. It's stuck. Next, I wanna talk a little bit about this rock that I'm standing on right here. Does anyone know what kind of rock this is? Asphalt, yeah, trick question. <laughs> um, this is asphalt. And this was actually a paved road. There was a paved road that went all the way through here. That borax mine was really successful for a while, but then eventually it started to not be as productive. They found cheaper borax elsewhere and they decided that they were going to stop exporting borax and they were going to start importing tourists instead. So they built roads, they converted their mining housing into hotels and restaurants and places for people to stay. You might recognize some of them. Now they are the ranch and the inn. Some of you might actually be staying there now. They started to really lean into this idea of Death Valley. They started to call this place a trip to hell. <laughs> but those mining companies turned tourism companies, decided that a great way to get people to come out here and visit this place was to encourage Congress to make this into a national park, right? People come out and they visit places that have that national park designation. So in the 1930s, they successfully petitioned the, to make this a national monument. And then later in the 1990s, uh, they petitioned for it to be a national park. So you all are actually here today because some mining company a long time ago decided that they wanted this place to be a national park so that more people would come and visit it. It's another kind of people that come out here to enjoy Death Valley. Um, and that's actually movie directors. So there was a famous movie that was filmed partially here. Does anyone know what that might be? Star Wars. Star Wars, yeah. Uh, Tatooine is the Mesquite Flat Sand Dunes. There was a big battle, a final stand that was filmed up at Dante's View. And then right here at those rocks behind you all, 
was the scene with R2-D2 and the Jawas. Some really interesting uh, movie history. Death Valley is really special. It's why I've chosen to come out here. It's why you all have chosen to come out here. We all have different names for this place, right? Tatooine, Death Valley. Behind me, we have Dripping Blood Mountain, which we now call Red Cathedral. So names have a little bit of power here in Death Valley. I want you to continue walking and enjoy the rest of this place. And eventually you're gonna come to the end. You're gonna say goodbye, Death Valley. And you get to decide what those names mean to you. So thank you all so much for coming. I hope you all enjoy the rest of your trip here in Death Valley. Another cool thing that we learned during the ranger-led program is that Death Valley is a bit unique. There are a lot of established trails that you can explore, but they also encourage you to take some of those side paths, or if you see a canyon that you want to go in, go check it out. As long as you're doing it safely, you can go off trail. And we're going to go check this one out. Oh, wow. Oh, this is awesome. We worked up quite the appetite today, so we came to the Stovepipe Wells area of the park, and there's a great saloon here called Bad Water Saloon, and we had some delicious food. I had a burger that was one of the best that I've had in a long time. It had brie cheese and arugula and a garlic aioli, and then Howard got a turkey leg. They started smoking those at eight o'clock this morning, and it was delicious. It was actually the first turkey leg I've ever had. Kaylin. <laughs> You know I've never had one? No. Did you just bite into it? Yeah. I feel very primal doing that. <laughs> and Howard got a barbecue sandwich, which he said was delicious as well. So we highly recommend the Badwater Saloon. Caitlin, what are you doing? Well, hello there. We uh, drove an hour out to see a volcanic crater, which looks amazing and I can't wait to show you, but I broke my cardinal rule, guys. I did not bring a jacket and it is much colder here than where we were at the campground when we left this morning. So I have this uh, scarf in the car, so this will be my outfit of the morning. <laughs> Hey, you got to do what you got to do, right? Oh, TD. Yeah. Yeah, I, uh, I brought my jacket. <laughs> because I told him last night to put it in the car, so you're welcome, Howard. Thank you. All right, let's go see this amazing crater. Oh, my gosh. Oh, wow. That's amazing. Wow. This was worth the drive out here. The colors and just so massive pretty amazing because you can actually see the crater from the parking lot. You don't even have to hike. If you want to hike, there is a trail that takes you up to the top of the crater to probably get an even better view, but uh, this is pretty good and we're only about, what, 20 steps away from the car. It's actually a rim trail that goes around the top of the crater, so you can hike all that or you can hike down if you want to, but that is definitely a harder hike to do. It's so neat to just sit and take in all the different shapes and colors and really just think about the sheer power and magnitude of the explosion that caused this crater. So what are we doing? We're getting gas, Caitlin, in the middle of the desert. Let me tell you, this is not a value type of situation. You take what you can get. Uh, <laughs> it is currently, and by the way, this is filming in March. It is $5.72, and this is the cheaper of the two gas stations, which are here inside Death Valley National Park. <laughs> and we did have a full tank when we started, but because you have to drive so much around here, you yeah. need a lot of gas. It's true. So thank goodness they have these. <laughs> So we're here at the Mesquite Flat Sand Dunes, which get their name from the mesquite trees that are on top of the dunes. And this is one of six sand dunes here in Death Valley National Park. And you need three things to form sand dunes because sand is found in the desert, but dunes aren't always found in the desert. You need a big supply of sand, 
wind and then something to slow that wind so they collect. So all these mountains that are around us are helping to form and protect these sand dunes. You are allowed to hike out on the sand dunes and you can sled or board them, but as we learned from White Sands National Park, it is quite hard and you need a lot of wax in order to get your sled nice and slick and then you need a lot of weight to go down. It's not like sledding in the snow at all. <laughs> what happened there? You need the proper footwear, Caitlin. Proper footwear. I know. Tennis shoes, not so much. No. We need some flippy floppies. Uh, it's about an hour hike out to the tallest of the dunes, but we're only about 50 feet away from the parking lot, and there's already a dune here. So don't feel like you have to hike way out just to get some uh, cool, epic shots of you on the sand. All right, we've made it just east of Mesquite Flat Sand Dunes, and there are two large pull-offs here at Devil's Cornfield. very crunchy and I just love the names of all of these places so they really leaned into the Death Valley moniker and named things very ominous sounding names to help draw tourists to such a unique sounding place and this is not corn in case you were wondering but these are arrowweed plants and they're really unique because of such a hot dry climate here the roots actually grow on the outside to help protect them Part of the reason for the name is because it looks like bundles of corn left in rows during harvest time if this was actually a cornfield. Huh, there's some salt. And because it's so light colored, you can burn very easily. So make sure that you have lots of sunscreen. Welcome to Badwater Basin. This is at negative 280 feet below sea level. This is the lowest spot in all of North America. And if you don't believe me, over here is a placard that indicates sea level and it's way up there. I'm very surprised that there is water here right now. I mean, it's been so dry and desolate everywhere else we have been. And then to come all the way down here to the lowest point and see water is very shocking. came down to the boardwalk and we learned that the water is actually the bad water pool. There was a surveyor mapping this area and he tried to get his mule to drink water from it and the mule wouldn't. It's not poisonous or anything, it's just really salty. So he called it bad water on his map and the name stuck. It's also home to a very rare species of snails called the bad water snails. You can really see the crystals of the salt sticking up. I'm gonna do something I can honestly say I've never done before. I am going to uh, use the restroom 280 feet below sea level. It's, uh, it's the world's lowest uh, pit toilet. <laughs> All right, I am very excited about our next stop, which is called Artist Drive. And there's a section that you can get out and look at called Artist Palette. And the oxidation makes all of these like super vibrant colors that you can see from the road. It's a nine mile loop road. There is a restriction. I think it's 25 feet vehicle length. So keep that in mind. But I'm super excited. Okay, we're here at Artist Palette. And as you can see behind me, there's a lot of different colors and that's because of the different minerals that are in the soil and in the rocks. And as water and heat has impacted those minerals, the colors come out. And so that's what's causing this artist palette of colors. Okay, artist drive might be one of my favorite things we've done here in Death Valley. You can also really tell on the back half why there is a vehicle length restriction. The road is so windy. There's tons of hairpins and you're going through very narrow roadways with like big boulders or canyons on either side. It is a spectacular display of different colors. It was really cool. I think this should definitely be on your Death Valley list. So we're here at Zabriskie Point. It is 100 yards one way, but this is the spot for sunrise or sunset in the park. Okay, we climbed to the top. It is paved and it is very smooth, but it is steep because it's a short distance. But once you get up here, the views are incredible. For one of the hottest places on earth, it can actually get quite chilly. It is March and we are bundled up with winter jackets, sweaters, all of that good stuff because the wind is whipping today. And we're in the car on the way to a special part of the park, which is actually across state lines in Nevada. All right, we're here at a very ominous sounding place. This is the Devil's Hole. At this location is an animal that is only found here and nowhere else on earth. 
it's the only location where the devil's hole pupfish reside. So the fish almost went to extinction uh, multiple times. Uh, the most recent one was in 2013 when they got down to 35 individuals. So when people come over to visit Devil's Hole, you have to walk over to the site. It is fenced around, but we do have a visitor's tunnel that allows you to see down to the water. I always recommend people to bring binoculars so they can actually see the fish up close because you cannot get down to the water level for security purposes. This kind of gives an idea of what the underwater cave system looks like wow. um, on a side profile. So we're gonna go into an area that's normally restricted to the public. A lot of it's for the safety of the ecosystem. This is Devil's Hole. A major part that you can see over here is kind of green in coloration on this side of the water surface. We call it the shallow shelf. That is the main breeding and feeding area for the Devil's Hole pupfish. It's so cool, <laughs> if you just stop and stare for a few minutes, you start to see all of them move. <laughs> That's so exciting. And so when the population had dwindled to 35, what was going on at that time that kind of led to their downfall? The previous year in 2012, we had a number of natural disturbances, so a number of different earthquakes around the world that caused the water to slosh around. And we also had two flash flood events that moved material down into Devil's Hole. The flash flood events are, are excellent to bring nutrient and resources into this limited resource environment. And then the earthquake kind of flushed the material off the shelf to kind of reset the system. However, a lot of these natural disturbances occurred during their major recruitment periods. So the recruitment wasn't as successful as they were in previous years. When you guys realized there were only 35 of them left, what was that like? Oh gosh, it was panic. We've done a, a number of different mitigation actions. We've added some cover packets to add some structure to the habitat. So younger fish can hide from predatory adults. We've adjusted some um, augmenting feeding that we do with that higher nutritional feed. Twice a year, we do a census population count, once in the spring and then once in the fall. We're at 265 fish as of um, the end of September, beginning of October of 2022. We're counting every single fish that's in the system. It's small enough and there's not as many fish that we can actually do that. And with multiple counts, it's amazing how close we are on the numbers uh, in, a, in a single day or, or over a two day period. So Jeff, we can see a lot of pupfish right here hanging out on the shelf. How far down do they actually go? So they'll go down to about 60 feet, but we'll, we'll find them at 70 feet every so often. Why do you think there are pupfish here in Devil's Hole? So that's a very good question. And um, a lot of the evidence has been erased or, or lost. About 10,000 years ago, it was a, what you call like an ice age, and water levels here were a lot higher, but it's unknown if the water levels were high enough to spill out, allowing fish to swim up and into the system. There's possibility of maybe people taking pupfish and moving them down and putting them into the system. Um, in, in either case, we don't know how they got here, but some genetic work has been done. They have a larger head size to the body ratio, and they lack pelvic fins. Some ideas on it might be because they're in a, such a still system, there's not much water movement. So Jeff, what are the other pupfish that are around this area? There's a lot of different pupfish. So in the immediate area, we have the Ash Meadows Amargosa pupfish and the Warm Springs pupfish. There's also pupfish found in Tacopa Springs, Shoshone Springs. And then if, when you get into the main Death Valley National Park, we have four pupfish species that reside in there. The Amargosa River pupfish, you have the Saratoga Springs pupfish, you have the Cotton Ball Marsh pupfish, and you have the Salt Creek pupfish. And are these your favorite pupfish? They are my favorite pupfish. It's just amazing just watching them moving around. They are the dominant species in this system. There's no one that consumes them any time of the year. When we're diving in here, the pupfish will come right up to our mask and just look at us and be like, what are you doing here? You shouldn't be here. <laughs> like you're in my house. Yeah, you're in my house. <laughs> so they're not scared. What, what are you doing here? Maybe you should leave. <laughs> That was just an amazing experience to think about these teeny tiny little fish that were almost completely wiped off the face of the earth. Really speaks to all the great work um, by the entire team. 
to protect the Devil's Hole pupfish, who are honestly really cute. Jeff was telling us about a program they have where they almost have like an emergency supply of pupfish, and they built an entire facility that mimics the environment of the Devil's Hole artificially, where they're able to keep a small supply of fish that if they actually had to repopulate, they could. That's how important and critical the work is that they're doing. And I think it's definitely worth a drive out here. Uh, it's about an hour away from Furnace Creek, so you'll want to budget some time, but it's so cool just to come out and see this very unique ecosystem that's kind of like buried, you know, like you cannot see it from the road. So to come and see it in person, make sure you bring binoculars. I think that will help a lot to be able to see it from that public platform area. So we just left Death Valley, uh, kind of heading to the west on uh, 190. Uh, that brings you essentially like up to Panamint. Well, there is a huge mountain pass and you go up 5,000 feet and then down 5,000 feet in a very short distance. We had to unhook the RV um, just from a safety standpoint because our brakes were getting really, really hot. So uh, just word of the wise, if you are going to do that, make sure that if it's possible, reduce your weight, unhook and uh, try your best to stay slow as you're heading down either side of that pass. And yeah, if you guys can see, I'm gonna zoom in here. This road is what we just came down. And it was pretty wild, but good job. Thank you. <laughs> All right, onward. We're gonna stay unhooked for a little bit. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna stay unhooked, let the brakes uh, kind of chill out for a while. Um, not quite to the point of like, break fire, but it was, it yeah. was getting hot. You they could were getting, smell them. You could smell them. They were yeah. getting real hot. <laughs> All right. Next stop, the coast. Let's go. On our next episode, it's off to coastal California for quite the epic adventure out to a chain of islands that makes up this unique and beautiful national park. We're taking you along to Channel Islands National Park, visiting the largest of those islands, Santa Cruz, home to an incredibly adorable island fox, beautiful views, and awesome hiking. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you next week.